All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we'd like to begin so that we uh, can uh, make sure things uh, start on a timely uh, fashion. So uh, my name is Mayan Stavans, and I'll be uh, chairing this uh, symposium on uh, metacognition. Our uh, first speaker will be uh, Francesco Poli. Um, he comes from uh, Donders Institute uh, from Radboud uh, University. Uh, all right. Okay, so today I will talk about infants' learning strategies. Um, and I want to start by saying that infants have stunning learning strategies. So if you think about it, already by the first day of their life, they're able to discriminate their native language from an unfamiliar language. So it probably means that already in the womb, they have started picking up regularities on what is happening out there in the world. And in the months and years that follow, they keep learning at an outstanding pace. So there must be something unique about infants' learning strategies. So our question is, how do infants learn so much and so quickly? And so in the literature, it has been suggested that infants might have a bias towards stimuli with a specific level of surprise or predictability. So for example, infants might be biased towards stimuli with high surprise. And in this way, they would always keep seeking for uh, new and stimulating challenges. And another option is that they are actually biased towards stimuli that are intermediate in predictability. And by, by doing this, they would avoid focusing on stimuli that are too predictable and thus too simple, or stimuli that are too unpredictable and thus impossible to, to learn. So there is this general approach where infants would have uh, attentional biases that guide them during learning. An alternative approach is that infants might rely on a different strategy, which is the maximization of the learning progress. So basically, the way it, it, would, it would work um, is that infants have this ability to track their own performance during learning. And so basically, by monitoring how good they are during learning, they would check whether they are, get better and better when, when they perform a given task. And if they do so, then they would stick to the task and they would keep learning. But if they are getting worse and worse in performing a certain task, they, they would drop the task and they would try to learn from something else. So in this, in this way, they would always maximize the learning progress, and by maximizing learning progress, they would learn very efficiently. So our question is, what are the mechanisms underlying infants' learning strategies? Are they using simple biases, or are they using this more complex uh, form of, of learning which is more complex because it requires a constant monitoring of their, of their own performance. So to study this, we designed an eye-tracking task. It was a visual learning task where infants were presented with sequences like this one, where there is a, there is a shape that appears as a cue in the middle of the screen and then as a target in one of four possible locations. And in this case, the sequence is very easy because the target is always in the same location. But most of the times, the sequences were more complicated. So basically, uh, the shape was appearing most of the times in one location, but it could also appear in other locations. So um, presenting infants with many of these kinds of sequences, we tested 50 infants that were around eight months of age. And I will come back to the infants in one minute, but before, I want to introduce you to uh, an additional participant that we had, and it was an ideal learner model. So basically, if we have these four target locations, A, B, C, and D, we can specify exactly what sequences infants were learning, like, for example, this one below. And basically, as the infants were, were seeing these sequences, we were also presenting the sequences to the ideal learner model. So the goal of this model is to estimate exactly the probabilities with which the targets could appear in each target location. So I will try to make an example. So basically, um, let's say that in this sequence, the first target appears in location A. Well, the model starts from the assumption that each location is equally likely to show the target. 
which is what you can see on the left, so there is a pie chart and everything is equally likely. But now, given the evidence, it will update the probabilities. So now the blue part for the location A is getting bigger, so it's more likely to see the target in location A. And then there is a new trial, and again, you will see a target in location A, so the model will again make an update, and now location A is even more likely. And then, for example, you have a trial in location C, and so now you have that location C gets a bit more likely, so the yellow part and all the others will shrink a bit. So basically, we could do this for every single trial of every single sequence, and we could come up with precise estimates of the probabilities. But the model could do something more than this. It could also estimate how surprising each single uh, target appearance was. So basically, surprise is just a negative form of, pr of uh, the probability. So basically, if the probability of an event is very low, then the event will be highly surprising. So we can come up with a trial-by-trial trial estimate of surprise, and for example, we can see that at trial one and two, the model does not really know what to expect, and so surprise is not really high. But another example is what happens at trial nine, where the target appears for the first time in location B. This, this has never happened before, and so it's highly unlikely, and so then it's highly surprising, and you can see a peak in surprise. So the model was estimating the surprise, but it was also estimating the predictability, which is a bit different because surprise entails how surprising each single target appearance is, while predictability has more to do with the how overall predictable the sequence is. And so again, we can come up with trial by trial estimates of the predictability. And what we can see, for example, here <coughs> is that uh, predictability tends to increase across trials uh, because, well, if you are presented with a mildly predictable sequence, then, of course, as you are exposed to the sequence, you get to know it better, and so it gets more predictable. Uh, but, of course, you can also see, for example, at trial four or nine, that are, there are also drops in predictability. And finally, the model was also able to estimate the learning progress. So basically, the model can keep track of its own performance in how good it is in uh, predicting the target location. And so basically, what it is doing here is, okay, let's check how good I am, if I'm the model, in predicting uh, the uh, target location right now, and let's compare it to how good I was in the previous trial. So basically, by comparing the change in performance, I'm, I'm getting a measure of how much I'm getting better. So this is the learning progress. So basically, we ended up having three different measurements for surprise, predictability, and the learning progress. And what we wanted to know was how these three measurements, which are um, partly related, but they're also clearly distinct, are influencing infant's allocation of attention and uh, infant's information processing. So to do that, we have now to link the idea learners estimate to uh, the infant's behavior, which we uh, collected via eye tracking. And specifically, we have three main research questions, and I will go through them one at a time. And the first question is whether infants allocate their attention based on the learning progress. And so basically, uh, as a measure of attention, we took the, the look away, where basically uh, look away is considered as an active decision to disengage from the task while if infants keep looking, that's a, uh, that's, that means that they keep allocating cognitive resources on the task. So we wanted to see how the look-away probability was determined by surprise, predictability, and the learning progress. And in all the models I will show, we are always also keep keeping into account uh, the simple passage of time. So this was controlled. And what I'm plotting here on the y-axis is the hazard, which is basically is proportional to the probability of looking away. So high hazard means high probability of looking away. And I will start from the less interesting results, which is for surprise and predictability. Both effects are significant. And what we can see if we focus on the graph in the middle for predictability is that there is a U-shaped distribution. So this is similar to what has been found already in the literature, where basically infants uh, are more likely to keep looking at the sequence if the predictability is intermediate, 
But if the predictability is low, so the sequence is, is very simple, or the predictability is high, and so the sequence is very complicated, then infants are more likely to look away. And what we find for surprise is a bit different because we find that as surprise increases, then also the probability of looking away increases. So basically when something is very surprising, infants are more likely to look away. And the reason for this might be that if something is very unexpected and is against infants' expectations, then they might not like it and they would prefer to look away. But these effects, however, are small if compared to the effect of the learning progress, where we can find that, as expected, when the learning progress is low, so there's, there's not much to learn uh, in the sequence, infants are very likely to look away. But as the learning progress gets higher, infants get more likely to keep looking at the task. So from this, it seems that infants are able to tailor their allocation of attention depending on what the learning progress is. And so they attend to the stimuli in a way that maximizes the learning progress. So if infants have this very complex strategy for learning, the next question is, well, we have to check that the learning strategy is actually effective. Uh, so to do that, we started from uh, findings in the literature which, where it's shown both in adults and infants that sequence learning leads to shorter like, saccadic latencies, where a saccadic latency is basically how fast infants are in looking from the cue location to the target location. So it's basically a nigh measure of reaction times. And so when things are predictable, of course, reaction times get faster and faster. So what we expect is that if infants have learned the sequences, when the uh, sequence is predictable, then they should be faster. And conversely, when there is a surprising event, they should get slower at looking at the stimuli. So we did another regression, and in this case, uh, I will plot on the y-axis the beta coefficients, where, of course, if a beta coefficient is positive, then there is a positive relationship between dependent <coughs> and independent variables. If it's negative, then there is a negative correlation. And we find what we expected, so for surprise, if an event was more surprising, infants would take longer to look at it. And also for predictability, if the sequence predictability was um, higher than infants would get faster. So they are, so it seems that they have this learning strategy which entails maximizing learning progress and it also seems that this learning strategy is effective. So our last question is, well if they are actually using the learning progress, we should find in their trial by trial information processing that they are actually sensitive to the fluctuations in learning progress. So if this is the case, then starting from um, studies on adults, where it's, where it's shown that more processing is reflected in longer dwell times, or in other words, when ad adults spend more time in stimuli that require more processing. So what we should find is that there is actually a relationship between um, the learning progress and the dwell time. Because, uh, well, in our case, trials in which there is a high learning progress are also trials that are very informative. And so they require additional processing. And as we expected, there is this relationship between uh, learning progress and looking time to the target. So dwell time is basically how long they keep looking at the target. So what this means is that um, there is also a nice dissociation between uh, surprise and predictability which determine the um, saccadic latencies and the learning progress which determines the looking time to the target. So to sum up, uh, basically what we find is that infants track the learning progress trial by trial during a learning task. So they are sensitive to these trial by trial fluctuations in the learning progress. And also, they are not just sensitive to them, they can actually use this information to decide whether or not to allocate cognitive resources on the task. So with this, I want to thank my supervisors, Sabine Hunius and Rohir Mars, and of course you all for the attention.
Um, how do you square the finding that the more surprising it is, the more likely they are to disengage with all infant psychology research? Mm -hmm. So, I'll go back to that slide. Or maybe not. Um, but basically, oh yeah. I think the main point is the learning progress has never been considered. So it, it was never in the equation when we were linking surprise to, to looking away. And also, uh, the main point that relates the looking time to surprise is not what is happening here, but rather what is happening here, where we find that there is no relationship between surprise and looking time. But at the same time, the way we measure looking time is very different from the usual way looking times are measured in infants' research. So here it's the looking time to the target, which usually lasts around one second. So they are very short looking times. So I think the, the nature of the task is contributing to this. And I also think that, well, when you present infants with unexpected information, this is not just surprising, but it also requires additional processing. So it's possible that uh, the, the, what we observe in longer looking time is not just infants are surprised, but it's more infants need to process this more. This is more informative because it's very in conflict with what they know. So they're disengaging and then potentially re-engaging. So surprise might lead to them to further search the scene potentially if they're disengaging from the target. So I'm trying to understand yeah. what the measure was that led to that unexpected slope. About the disengagement, well, so um, surprise and the learning progress are partly correlated. So what this study suggests is that actually what determines infant's attention is the learning progress more than surprise. So the effect is way bigger. So it could be like a residual effect after controlling for the learning progress, which has never been done before. So it's really not directly comparable. Hi, really interesting data. I have two questions. One is that if you look at dwell time and you know hazard or tendency to look away, it seems like you find learning progress is the bigger predictor. But then if you look at saccade latency, it's surprise and predictability. So I'm wondering if you're proposing or if you think that there are different mechanisms or different effects of those two. Are there different systems that are leading to saccade, differences in saccade latency and different systems that are you know, affecting dwell time or tendency to look? It's one question. The second question is how do you dissociate, given that you also just mentioned that surprise and learning progress are related, mm -hmm. how, in what circumstances are they dissociable in this task? Okay, so um, let's see about the, the second question. If we go back here to, if we look at the, uh, the fluctuations in surprise and in learning progress, well, for example, uh, we can check trial nine, where l surprise is very high because this event has never happened before. But at the same time, uh, well, when you get to trial nine, w you know that sometimes there are some surprising events. So in this case, the surprise is high, but the learning progress is low. So they can be dissociated. And the correlation, I think, is around 0.5 between the two. So it's enough to get a good dissociation between the two. And can you repeat the first question? Okay. The first question is whether or not you think there's one, I'll reframe it in case mm -hmm. this is helpful, whether or not you think there's one underlying mechanism that yeah. you're just picking up on different aspects of when you're looking at surprise predictability and learning progress, arguably with different weights, or whether or not you think there might be uh, multiple underlying mechanisms, possibly one that's better indexed by saccade latency and another that's better indexed by looking behavior or dwell time. Yeah. So one thing is, we are planning to look into individual differences, but we haven't. Mm -hmm. So it's also possible that there is a developmental trajectory where they go from easier strategy to more difficult ones. And so we got a sample where some of the infants are using these two strategies here, which are simpler, 
and are actually very similar one to the other, and most of the infants are using another strategy. So if that's the case, then, uh, yeah, but moving around that age range, we, we, we should find a change also in the strategies that they use. Thank you. All right, so our uh, next speaker will be uh, Madeline Pels, right, uh, from MIT. Hi, everyone. Um, great, so today I'm going to talk about intuitive statistics and metacognition in children and adults. So first, take a look at these four images. Even with a quick glance, you can get a lot of information about the structure of these natural and artificial objects. Some are random, some are more structured, some are simpler and more complex, and even though you didn't see how they were made, you might even be able to make inferences about their generative processes. In this talk, I'm gonna use the word statistics uh, quite broadly, referring to the fact that structured data surrounds us, and that we're able to leverage this in a variety of cognitive tasks. So first, just a little background on intuitive statistical reasoning. We know that even very young children are intuitive statisticians. Infants as young as eight months can uh, match samples to populations and look longer when the sample violates their expectations. Young children can integrate the bias and preferences of the person drawing samples into their inferences about objects and populations. And they are sensitive to statistical structure in the world that goes far beyond balls and boxes. So in this example, infants can track statistical regularities in a continuous speech stream, which is crucial for word learning. So today I'm gonna to talk about two very different tasks. In study one, I'll talk about some preliminary data in a new study that asks how adults and children extract structure in the environment to make rich inferences and generative, about generative processes. In this particular case, inferring agents' mental states from their search patterns. And in study two, I'll talk, talk about a more complete study that investigates how adults and children use statistical information to inform metacognitive planning and decision making. Here we ask if adults and children can use the difficulty of a task to estimate how much information they need in order to successfully solve a problem even without access to any data. So I'm gonna start with study one and this is in collaboration with Julian Hare Edinger. So we know that even young, in, um, young infants can recognize agents' goal-directed actions and are sensitive to the efficiency of these actions. We also know that children infer the presence of an agent when they see order in the environment, uh, for example, in the presence of organized blocks, or from the tones of a xylophone being played in a different order than an inanimate ball would be able to create as it rolls down a ramp. In this study, we ask how general and flexible our abilities are to recover information from a static scene. In an arbitrary domain and with a minimal backstory, are adults and children able to go beyond inferring just the presence of an agent to inferring their richer goals and mental states? As a first example of how we can use the statistics of our environment to make rich inferences, consider how much we can glean from animal tracks in the snow. We can infer rich things about what type of animal made them, what its goal or destination was, and even reconstruct social interactions between multiple animals with intersecting tracks. You probably have your own intuitions about what may have occurred in the second photo, but I have a hunch that the blogger that posted these was underestimating her child's ability to make his own inferences when she told him, looks like the animals had a dance party, while she scanned the surroundings for blood, bones, and chunks of fur. Uh, in our task, we wanted a context with two important features. One, that it could be quantitative in a way that lent itself to modeling people's beliefs, and two, that it didn't provide any clues as to the order of which the agent's actions occurred. So participants had to infer the order of events as well as infer the agent's mental states when taking those actions. So what we landed on was a set of drawers. It sounds boring, uh, but it actually lends itself to a very rich space of questions. For example, imagine you see this set of drawers uh, with one drawer left open. If you knew that someone was in this room looking for their sweater, what do you think they knew about with the location of it? The data here point to an agent that likely knew exactly where their sweater was put away, but compare that to this setup. Here, you might have the intuition that this person didn't know where their sweater was put away and had to search in order to find it. But beyond that, I'm guessing you also have a strong intuition that he started searching from the top left, then moved to the second row, and eventually found his sweater in this drawer. And here are a few more richer examples if you'll kind of play along with me for a minute. Uh, so take a look at this scene. What do you think might have happened in this scene? Someone maybe in the first couple rows. Say it again. Yeah, exactly. So maybe someone started looking and then remembered where it was. It was in the bottom drawer. Does anyone else have a different intuition? 
Someone told him, great. So maybe he was searching and then, you know, someone yelled up to him where his sweater was. Great. So um, remembering was one thing that, the one possibility that I have. Another is that uh, maybe he thought it was in the right bottom drawer and then it wasn't and he had to begin searching again from the top. I'm seeing some people nodding. And then finally, maybe he was looking for two objects, one where he knew the location of and one where he didn't. So we can get a lot of rich um, information from this simple scene. And finally, take a look at this example. So what do you think happened here? People are laughing. <laughs> yeah, child, I heard. Great, so maybe it's play. So uh, it's kind of hard to explain this setup with efficient searching actions, which interestingly leads us to assume that maybe someone wasn't looking for anything. Uh, maybe a child was just playing around with a dresser or making a pattern from the drawers. Interestingly, when we simply change the color of the open drawers, there's now an intuitive explanation for the pattern. So maybe they only knew it was inside of a green drawer. So it's interesting how you can play with this space. So to get a sense of whether adults shared my intuitions about this task, we first ran a study on MTurk, where participants were told that they would see images of a dresser after someone looked for something inside, and asked to rank possible explanations on a sliding scale um, from completely inaccurate explanation to kind of a perfect explanation. So here, just two examples are shown to give you a sense, but they were given a wide range of, of options. So in our first round of pilot data, we asked for explanations for six images, four of the examples we went through together, and two additional ones, both asking about random search, as well as the approximate knowledge, so say it was kind of, you knew it was in the center of the dresser. Adults consistently rated the predicted hypotheses as the most likely to have created a given pattern of open drawers. They also made interesting judgments of alternative hypotheses, which we hope to capture in a computational model. So again, this is kind of preliminary work. So I'm currently collaborating with Julian Hara Edinger to design a POMDP model that calculates the optimal actions for an agent to take in the world based on their beliefs and the restrictions of the environment. So in this case, it'll provide a likelihood for each belief state for an agent that searched the drawers that were left open. To translate the study to children, we first had them complete a warm-up task where they counted the drawers in a physical miniature set of drawers. They then searched for a sticker hidden inside of one of the drawers to familiarize them with the cover story of the test questions. They were then shown six forced choice test questions, each with a target image and a distractor. In this first study, as a proof of concept, we hand matched targets and distractors in order to create pretty clear discriminations. Chil children were told that the character on the page knew about where their sticker was hidden, sorry, they were told what the character on the page knew about where their sticker was hidden when they had played the same game as the child had just played looking for their sticker, and were then asked to choose which set of drawers they thought that that character had searched inside of. So I'm not sure if you can read the font, but um, for example, the top, uh, the top left says, Sam knew exactly where his sticker was hidden, and the correct answer would be he searched in the green dresser. <coughs> Great, so um, this was the first full sample that we've collected, and when collapsed across all six trials, so there's the number of correct trials on the y-axis and age on the um, x-axis, children performed above chance, succeeding in 70% of trials. In addition, a pre-registered exploratory analysis uncovered a significant age effect, with children improving at the task across age. When split by question, so along the x-axis is each individual um, question and the y-axis is proportion correct across children now. Um, children perform significantly above chance in all trials except the random search and the remembering conditions. So in addition to having less power when you split the data this way, these also seem like some of the most conceptually difficult trials. While some trials were straightforward to interpret, such as the one with just one drawer open, the understanding of randomness and false belief required for success in these two trials might not be available to younger children. So I hope to explore this more as we continue this study. So as an interim summary, the preliminary results suggest that adults and children can leverage simple patterns of data to infer both the order of an agent's actions from a still scene and also the mental state that gave rise to those actions. So moving on to the next study, um, while the last study focused on how we might use the structure of data to infer others' mental states and actions, this study moves to how we might use statistical information for our own planning and decision making. Um, so this is in collaboration with Kelsey Allen. So historically, children at eight years old and even above are still showing difficulty with certain types of metacognitive tasks. Uh, they show errors in prediction of their own memory span, they're overconfident in judgments of their own ability, and they fail to modify study time based on the difficulty of the task at hand. But more recent work has demonstrated that infants and children are able to judge the difficulty of tasks and modulate their behavior in response. Infants prefer to attend to events of intermediate complexity rather than something too predictable or unstable as we just heard about in the last talk. Children are able to label what they know and don't know. They can formulate relevant questions to fill in information gaps, judge whether answers to those questions are satisfactory, and they explore longer in an auditory perceptual task when the discrimination between numbers, in a, um, numbers of marbles in a box is more difficult by shaking the box and trying to listen for which um, marbles are inside. So this is similar to um, a study that I just mentioned, but 
as discussed before, if I showed you this setup, um, if, or if I showed an eight-month-old this, this setup uh, and told you it was drawn from one of these two populations, it's pretty easy to know that it's most likely from the, pink, the mostly pink box. But what if I hadn't shown you the sample that I drew? Would you be able to guess about how much information you might need to solve this problem? So in this case, the populations are pretty separate from each other, so maybe just a few samples would be enough. But what if I gave you this discrimination problem instead? Would you do you think that you would need more? So the idea is that even if you don't have a real sample to match back to the population, you still might have a sense of how difficult the problem of discriminating between the two populations would be and how much information you might need to solve it. So this is what I refer to as an intuitive power analysis. Our first two experiments sought to ask if children were sensitive to the difficulty of discriminating two populations and if they would ask for more information for harder discriminations. We first showed them a warm-up trial, similar to that pink uh, box setup that I showed you before, just where they practiced matching a sample to a population. After training, we moved to a task with three different discriminations, ranging from the hardest, which is Elmo over there, with 60-40 discrimination, um, to the easiest, uh, with 90-10. So participants were then given an image, um, given a set of images of tubes that held different numbers of balls, ranging from 1 to 10, and they were asked to assign a tube to each of the characters to play their game. So the question was, if each of these characters were to play that game where we drew out samples and they had to choose which box I was picking from, which set of tubes would you give to each character? Uh, so our prediction was that they would give the most, assign the most balls to the character that had the hardest task, and so on until it was the fewest um, for the easiest task. So along the x-axis here, we have um, the proportion. So again, the difficult um, one is on the left, ranging to easy on the right. And the number of balls that they, that they selected in those tubes is on the y-axis. So we found that children requested more data for more difficult discriminations. So here the children who correctly ordered those um, three different tasks are highlighted in blue. In this case, it was 15 out of 24. Um, so children succeeded in this task. They were able to rank the difficulty and then request more information in the harder tasks. We successfully pre-registered and replicated the study. Um, and after this, we wanted to leverage the quantitative nature of this task a little bit more. So this was three different discriminations, but this is a huge space, and so it was interesting to explore that more. So we then asked if, if adults make judgments um, across maybe more varied discriminations. So we went back to MTurk, and what we did was we showed adults also similar pairs of boxes um, with inverse proportions of colored balls in each, and asked them how many samples they would need to see to know which box I was sampling from. So importantly, it was as easy to type 80 into this box as it was to type in 30, so there was no cost of sampling, at least explicitly, in this task. Um, the boxes were presented in a random order, so they couldn't use uh, that to determine the size of the sample. And in this case, it ranged from 95.5, a very easy task, all the way to um, 51.49, which is essentially impossible. So across the x-axis, we have the proportion of colored balls, again, from difficult to easy, and then the number of balls that people requested, um, adults requested in this task. So adults did, in fact, adjust their information gathering in response to difficulty, asking for more samples in the harder cases. Interestingly, a few adults spontaneously asked for zero, zero samples in the most difficult case, the 5149. So we wanted to see if we explicitly offered the chance to quit if adults could choose to do so rationally, because you could ask for you know, 1,000 in that case, but instead they were choosing to just say zero. So in the next task, we added just a short addition to the instructions, saying if you think this game would be too hard to figure out, please enter zero. So for each of the proportions, they were able to either enter zero or enter how many samples they would like to take. So in the plot on the right, uh, it's proportion of the colored balls, again, from easy to hard. And then on the y-axis is the number of zero, so the number of people that were quitting. As you can see, when given the option to quit, adults rationally selected this option for the most difficult discriminations. And that suggests that they're sensitive to when the question might be too difficult to answer. Or maybe not too difficult, but too costly. So in the first task, adults were modulating how much information they requested based on the difficulty of the discrimination even though the data had no explicit cost, suggesting that they might be imposing some implicit cost of, the sampling, of sampling additional data. So in this next experiment, we made another very subtle change to make the sampling of cost explicit. So you can see there's now just a little plus sign next to the box. Instead of just typing in how many they wanted, they had to click each time they sampled another ball. And on MTurk, that's enough cost. <laughs> um, great, so here's the data from that. So it's the same axis as you've seen on the plot before. And as you can see, sampling is uh, very lo much lower, but they still requested more data as the discriminations become more difficult. So this supports the idea that they're sensitive to cost of gathering information. So when we added this explicit cost, they sampled less. Uh, but they also might be inferring costs even in that first cost-free condition. So the adults were successful and kids, whoa, <laughs> kids were successful. Um, 
uh, in the in the easier tasks that we tried. So we tried to just do the full quantitative task in kids. So they did the warm-up trial, like I mentioned before. They did the task with three different discriminations. And then I just pulled out my computer and essentially ran them through the MTurk task that we ran adults through. Again, they were in randomized order. Um, and here's the data for the, for the children. So I think they did very impressively. This is a free response task. We just asked them how many balls they'd like to sample. And although there's a lot more variance, just like adults, children requested more data when the discrimination was more difficult, even in a free response task. Uh, and so we also replicated this study in a new sample, and the results look very similar. Great, so in summary, adults and children have metacognitive knowledge of their own uncertainty, consistent with the idea that they can perform these intuitive power analyses. They're able to represent how much information they might need to solve a problem, even before they have access to the information itself. So to summarize everything, adults and children are sensitive to the structure that exists in their environments and can use it broadly to both infer generative processes and agents' mental states from very sparse data, as well as inform metacognitive processes that help to modulate information seeking. Thank you. Uh, lovely data, and I have a question about the drawers experiment, mm -hmm. about the random search and the efficient search. You called it efficient, it, and it's a sequential serial search. Mm -hmm. It looks like unless you have to close the drawer right after opening it, it's not any more efficient than the random search. The, in sequential search, it's mm -hmm. useful only if you can't tell which ones you've opened already. Yeah. So I'm just curious about like why do people think it's more efficient, why you think it's more efficient, and why the model thinks it's more efficient, and how it's formalized. Great, um, so the, you're right that definitely the reason to open things is in order is partially for memory, to be able to kind of track where you've been before so you're not resampling. Um, but the way that we're thinking about efficiency is not just in terms of memory, but also in terms of distance you need to travel to open a drawer. So it's just the next closest thing. And then you're right that maybe the, the most optimal thing then would be to do like sort of a snake motion through it. Um, but the model has very, it's also not completed, but it has very few priors. And one of them is that you start a new row the next time. So we kind of overcome the extreme efficiency in that case. Thanks. Thank you. Very, very interesting data. I Thank have you. also a question about uh, the drawers experiment which came into my mind when I saw that you were marking the proportion of correct choices. Mm. And I was thinking, there is no correct choice, really, in the sense that, uh, and this is connected to questions in philosophy that have been uh, uh, presented since Quine, essentially. Mm -hmm. You can always make up a story such that one kind of strategy becomes correct. So if I tell you something about uh, beliefs of the person and so on, you can think that something that you would consider to be a random choice is not a random choice. You mm -hmm. can make one. So my question there was, uh, did you actually try to explore whether by modifying the belief that, uh, th or you are playing the subject says about uh, uh, what uh, the searcher is searching for, actually something that mm -hmm. turns out to be extremely uh, uh, unlikely as a first choice. In other words, what you are trying to get at is, uh, uh, as it were, the, the baseline optimal strategy but we know for our uh, you know, everyday experience that this is, mm -hmm. it works when you have no information, but it's very rarely we don't have information. Information that makes things which seem to be uh, unlikely pattern actually the right, the right kind of answer. I wonder if you have considered uh, looking at uh, this part of your possible extension of the paradigm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, um, in the kid data, at least, we tried to hand pick things that were at least the most clearly efficient or not efficient. So it's very low probability that if you just open one random drawer that you would find something if you had no idea compared to the one that was efficient search. Um, I hear you that there are different ways to explain different beliefs. And one, um, uh, one thing that we hope that the model will help us with is if we just put in very few sort of um, priors on the way that efficient searching works, what it'll come up with. Um, we do find that adults have a really strong prior about efficiency. <laughs> So in that MTurk study where we just give them the things and ask them to, um, to rate those different explanations, they are kind of doing, you know, it was based on my intuitions, but then also the intuitions of those adults. And in terms of kids, some children who were picking what I found to be like almost a consistent wrong choice, I did ask them for explanations just as like to add on to my study. 
And almost always when I asked them to explain, they would then go, oh, wait a second. And then they would pick the right one and then explain why it was the right one. So um, it's an interesting idea that maybe we can get deeper at it. One other thing to do with adults maybe would be to have more of a free response answer. So instead of just make them, making them rate those different explanations, also offer them a chance to give an alternative. Yeah, to make up a story of what they were looking for. Yeah, we, we, we do tell the kids what the story is and then ask them to find the drawers that they were looking in, so we try to constrain the story in that way, but we could do the opposite with adults. Thank you. Do we have time? Okay, is it short, she says? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wonder what you think in the, uh, in the second set of studies where they have to come up with a sampling number, a sampling size, mm -hmm. what do you think they're doing? So one possibility is that they are uh, consulting some kind of power analysis distribution that they somehow have the capacity to, to produce. Yeah. Another is that they're doing some kind of heuristic, like they're uh, going through, they're play, they're play gaming it, right? So they say, let's pretend I'm going to select from this one box mm -hmm. and see how many draws it takes me in this uh, uh, role play of it mm -hmm. uh, before uh, I'm I'm sure uh, which box it's from. Like. Do, do you think that they have a heuristic, or do you think they have a distribution they can just consult, or how does it work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple things we've thought about. Definitely, if you, if you compute the ideal number of samples that you should take from a very hard distribution, it doesn't look linear. It looks extremely exponential. So p people aren't, aren't doing the actual calculation in their heads. So I don't know the heuristic that they're using. It's possible it's just similar to the kids where we give them the three options. They say, oh, that's hard. They should get the most and kind of you know, base it off of that. Um, but it's also possible they're doing something a little more complicated, like you're saying, that involves simulation. So I think we'd have to understand a little bit more about what that would look like if um, people were actually thinking, well, if I had three, what might that look like, and sort of collapsing across the options, because they don't actually have the samples to look at to make that decision. Thank you. So our next speaker will be uh, Kirsten uh, Blakey from the University of Stirling. Hi. Um, appropriate information seeking is one of many capacities that have been suggested as cognitive mechanisms that um, might support human cumulative culture. Cumulative culture is the process that results in increased functionality of cultural traits over multiple generations of learners. So seeking out relevant information from appropriate social sources is common in human adults, um, and compared to children and non-humans, adults appear to demonstrate key differences in the ways that they seek, attend to, and use social information. It's surprising then that, that the majority of developmental social learning paradigms only look at children's responses to information that has been provided for a particular task, um, and do not address children's ability to seek out the information for themselves. Um, being required to seek out relevant information when faced with multiple potential models is more similar to real-world social learning than simply being given the relevant information in the first place. So flexible rules that influence individuals' use of social information are referred to as social learning strategies. Generally, social learning strategies should help filter out less useful aspects of social information. They influence when and how individuals use social information and where the information should be sourced from. Cecilia Hayes has argued that there are distinct categories of social learning strategies based on specific types of decision rules. So she gives the analogy of planetary versus cook-like strategies. So planetary strategies or um, heuristic strategies are driven by domain general associative learning processes and they direct learning towards objects, agents and events that are most likely to provide useful information. Um, an example would be to copy older individuals. Um, like laws of planetary motion, the rules are not in the minds of the agents themselves but instead they are only in the minds of those describing the agent's behaviour. Um, likewise, planets are not aware of the laws that govern their movement, but their movement persists anyway. Um, Hayes suggests that the behaviour of young children and non-humans can be described and predicted by this type of decision rule. Alternatively, cook-like or explicitly metacognitive strategies are more like the decision rules that a cook would use when following a recipe. These types of rules are, are represented within the mind of the agent, and they know about the rules that influence their choices, and that their choices are influenced by their knowledge of the rules. These explicitly metacognitive strategies are the result of learning through social interaction and reflect an understanding of the relationship between experience and knowledge. 
Um, they are reasoning based and therefore offer greater flexibility than the heuristic strategies. It's these reasoning based strategies that are proposed to be responsible for, for a distinctively human cumulative culture. So to test this, we need to build a picture of the development of these strategies in children. In the current study, we explored a reliance on model-based biases as heuristic social learning strategies. And we expected that these were more likely in younger children. The task was designed so that using model-based biases would be inappropriate. So biases relating to model characteristics, model characteristics such as copy older individuals um, would not be flexible enough to lead to appropriate information seeking. Um, to seek social information effectively, the seeker needs to recognise what information is required, uh, where to find this information, and needs to understand that other people are sources of information, all of which require reasoned understanding, which we thought was more likely in older children. So the aim of this study was to investigate age-related changes in children's ability to seek out and use appropriate social information. Appropriate information seeking and information use were expected to be higher in older children as they transitioned to using more reasoning-based strategies. By looking at the development of children's information seeking, it should be possible to identify age-related changes that reflect different um, social learning strategies. So we also aim to explore the expected age-related transition from the use of model-based biases um, to the use of reasoning-based strategies that are driven by the relevance of the information. The task was designed so that using model-based biases would be inappropriate. So if children were appropriately seeking the information, then model-based biases should have been overridden in favour of reasoning-based strategies. If we find that younger children were struggling with appropriate information seeking, uh, they might instead be relying on model-based biases, which are unlikely to involve reasoning. So the task, um, we tested 218 three to eight-year-old children who completed four trials each. Um, each trial consisted of two phases, an information seeking phase followed by an information use phase. Um, the order of the trials was randomised between participants, but all trials followed the same procedure. So in each trial, children were given a wooden box like this one that was locked with a distinctive padlock. Um, and they were also given two coloured keys. They were told that they were going to try and unlock the box, uh, but the only, one of the, um, one, only one of the keys could unlock the padlock. We told them that before they tried to open the box, they would get, a, get to watch a video. And then we explained that they would see four pictures of other people that had boxes that they wanted to unlock and that they could choose one of the pictures to watch a video of that person trying to open their box. Okay, so pictures of one adult and one child of each gender were displayed on a touchscreen tablet. A single target video showed a combination of padlock and keys which exactly matched that, that, the one that the participant had. So while three non-target videos contained combinations of padlocks and keys which were um, completely different to the, the one that the participant had. Um, so selecting the target video would provide useful information about which key would unlock the padlock, um, but selecting any of the non-target videos would provide irrelevant information. Um, the age and gender of the target demonstrator was different in each trial. So appropriate information seeking required children to select the target video by reasoning that information that was required to achieve their goal, and therefore which model would be uh, um, able to provide the relevant information. Um, or children could have simply matched the combination of padlock and keys that they had with one of the potential demonstrators. If children were reasoning appropriately, they should have completely disregarded the age and gender of the demonstrators. Um, once the picture had been selected, the corresponding um, demonstration video began to play. Um, if the target video was selected, children saw either a successful or an unsuccessful demonstration. So if it was successful, they saw a demonstrator choose the key which unlocked the padlock, so the box was opened. If it was unsuccessful, they saw the demonstrator choose the wrong key, which didn't unlock the padlock, so the box stayed closed. As there were only two keys and children were shown the usefulness of one of them, both types of demonstration were potentially equally informative. If children selected a non-target video, they still watched a demonstration, um, but the information was not relevant for helping them to unlock their own box. Like in this example where the non-target video gives information about a box that is different to the one that the participant has on the left. Um, we measured successful information seeking by the proportion of trials in which um, children selected the target demonstration video. So here we have age and years along the x-axis from um, three to eight, and the proportion of target video selections is shown in the darker blue, while the um, non-target selections are in the lighter blue. So overall, children were successful in 65% of the trials, 
Um, and as you can see, we found um, that information seeking improved significantly with age, um, but actually all age groups were significantly above, uh, selected the target videos significantly more often than would be expected by chance. Um, the high rate of target video selections that we saw in seven and eight-year-olds um, was consistent with our expectations that older children's increased metacognitive understanding would allow them to identify appropriate sources of information. And we also found a significant effect of gender congruence on children's information seeking. We found that children were significantly more likely to select the target video in trials where the target demonstrator was the same gender as them. And similarly, children were more likely to, and in error, select non-target videos in which the demonstrator was the same gender as them. So the task, as the task was designed so that appropriate information seeking should have overridden model-based biases, we suggest that the gender congruence effect found in target and non-target video selections is driven by model-based biases, particularly in younger children, as the older children's information seeking was so close to optimal. So after children had viewed the target video, we looked at how they used the information from the demonstration. Um, so basically whether they selected the correct key or not. Um, the appropriate response was dependent on the success of the demonstration that they watched. So viewing a successful demonstration where the key um, unlocked the padlock should have encouraged a copying response. And viewing an unsuccessful demonstration where the key did not unlock the padlock should have encouraged avoidance of that selection and uh, selection of the alternative key. So we measured informa uh, successful information use by the proportion of trials in which children selected the target key. So for this analysis, we only included the trials in which children had watched the target video. Um, so again, here we have age and years along the x-axis. Um, and the proportion of target key selections is shown in the darker green and non-target selections in the lighter green. The left-hand panel shows um, uh, responses following successful demonstrations that require children to copy. And the right panel shows the responses after unsuccessful demonstrations which require children to avoid the key chosen in the demonstration and choose the other one instead. Um, overall, children chose the target key in 83% of the trials. Um, we found, again, that um, children chose the target key more often after successful demonstrations um, than unsuccessful ones, and that children's information use improved significantly with age across both demonstration types. Um, the proportion of target key selections was particularly high in six, seven, and eight-year-old children following successful demonstrations, with children successfully copying the demonstrator's key choice in more than 95% of the trials. Um, we think that our results suggest that older and younger children might be approaching the information-seeking phase of the task differently. Um, it, it appears that older children are using reasoning-based understanding akin to explicitly metacognitive social learning strategies. This understanding is reflected in their relatively high success rates in both the information-seeking and information-use phases of the task, um, which together suggests that they were aware of which information was required who was an appropriate source of the information, and importantly, they also knew what to do with the information once they had received it, um, with good rates of success following both the successful and unsuccessful demonstration types. Um, on the other hand, younger children appear to have relied on imperfect model-based biases um, when they struggled with appropriate information seeking. We suggest that their poor use of the information acquired in the demonstrations indicates that they hadn't recognized the information that they needed and hadn't used reasoning-based strategies to select the model and therefore didn't know what to do with the information when they had received it. Um, these suggestions are also supported by the gender congruence effect that we discovered in the target and particularly the non-target video selections, um, which indicated a reliance on these model-based biases in the younger children. The relatively late emergence of the capacity to use reasoning-based or explicitly metacognitive strategies um, suggests that this may be a cognitive mechanism that is unique to humans and is unlikely to be observed in non-humans. So we think that our findings are consistent with the interpretation that reasoned understanding is a mechanism that is necessary for a distinctively human cumulative culture. Our results also highlight the need to expand developmental social learning paradigms to account for information seeking as well as information use. Thank you all very much. It's very interesting to hear you talk about the developmental findings with respect to metacognition. Um, 
instead of with simply with respect to the ability to recall or remember the information in general. Um, there's nothing to reflect over if it never got ported into the system over which you would reflect. So do you have things like low-level controls where you're looking at three-year-old's abilities to integrate three different sorts of colors, remember that after shifting back and forth between videos? Um, the videos were entirely separate, so each trial was entirely separate from one another. All the demonstrators were completely different, um, and all the um, padlocks and keys were entirely different. I'm not sure if that's really answering your question there. I'm sorry. Is there any way that these data could be explained instead, not by a reflection on the thoughts, but the inability to generate the information in the first place? Um, you mean like um, inability to generate what information they needed to complete the task? Or? Uh, no, uh, just to simply uh, remember, oh, hey, I saw that this person used an orange key, so an orange key is what I should use. Oh, I see. Then, um, the response was immediate. There was nothing really to remember. The video played, and then instantly children had in front of them the box. So I wouldn't say that memory was necessarily required for that. Particularly in younger children, we found that they were at chance when it came to selecting a key, whether they had watched the target video or the non-target videos um, across all the trials. Um, so I wouldn't say that memory is really a problem there. Hi, um, I was a bit confused why you're concluding from the data that the younger children are using model-based imperfect heuristics or biases. So for instance, you're showing the three-year-olds are choosing completely randomly. So if they had a systematic bias, they could have been systematically wrong, but the fact that they just choose randomly, it's hard for me to see how you tell that apart from just not having any prediction or any bias. So for the information seeking, they were significantly above chance oh yeah, um, for... But, but once you get, once they choose a picture, when they choose between the two different... Uh, so you're saying, oh, they have a bias to choose so one of the videos. So their biases are to do with the yeah. information seeking part of the task. Right. Um, so the, whether who they choose exactly. as their model. Yeah. Um, so if they were choosing appropriately, they should have... Um, completely disregarded the age or gender of the right. yeah, demonstrator, but um, a lot of the younger children are not doing that. They are very biased by gender, um, and it is about chance level if you um, collapse across gender and say that the target video would be a female demonstrator rather than okay. splitting it by the four. Um, at that point, they are at chance. Um, but with information use, we're not looking so much at biases, just more at whether they um, are using the information appropriately by copying or not copying what the demonstrator has done when they've been given the correct information or like what could be correct information, like it's right. equally informative to have incorrect information in that scenario. Thank you, sorry for missing that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so in your experiment, you pit model-based and informativeness against one another um, and you hope that the three-year-olds are gonna look for the most in informative video, but they may like watching videos of three-year-old girls, if they're a three-year-old girl, to mm -hmm. see what that three-year-old girl is going to do with her box. So they may be seeking different information. Have you thought about separating out the two um, questions, so matching the model and seeing if they can choose, now there is no conflict, the box that they should want to know about, and then separately, who would you like to see open this box? Do you want to watch a girl, a little girl or a... Yeah, uh, so an older male. I tried to stay away from that, um, to be honest, with this study. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be a good follow-up like to expand that. Um, a lot of the literature um, specifically asked children to choose um, between two particular models or multiple models that are all going to show them the right answer or the wrong answer. Um, I wanted to see whether they could pick out the right answer for themselves. Um, but I, I see your point about being able to like <laughs> have maybe two boxes that are the correct one with two different demonstrators as an option, then two that are wrong and two demonstrators that would... Just as if the competence is there, but being masked by an overwhelming, you know, another, another factor that influences their yeah, information no, that, that's seeking. good to think about as well. Thank you. Right, we'll have to actually end here. Um, thank you very much for all our speakers.